Good morning and welcome to worship at Slateville and Slate Ridge Presbyterian Churches. Just a couple announcements before we start. We will be having communion today at Slateville. Um, and so we will have uh, communion as part of the video worship. If you are wanting to partake of um, communion this morning, you will need to pause the video at the moment and go get um, a piece of bread or um, a roll, wine or grape juice. I know someone used coffee and donuts as their communion elements. Um, it really doesn't matter, um, but if you want to participate, you're gonna need to go and prepare and get what you want for communion. And then also just as a reminder that Slate Ridge will be having its annual congregational meeting next week. And we will be doing all of the business that we couldn't get done at the end of 2020 with the election of officers, um, the auditors and whatever else needs to be done. We will be doing that next week. But if you would now join me in our call to worship. This is a great and joyous festival day. Come and celebrate the amazing good news. We gather for worship in awe and wonder. The tomb is empty. Death does not have the last word. Sing songs of praise for God is good, God's steadfast love endures forever. God has answered our prayers with salvation. Jesus Christ is alive and we too shall live. Open your hearts and minds to the risen Christ. We are greeted by name and welcomed here. This is the day the Lord has made we will rejoice and be glad in it. And join me in our opening prayer. We greet the dawning brightness of this special day with hopes renewed. We have known grief and sorrow, loss and tears, fears and failure. Meet us here, living Christ, for we need this time of resurrection. We need your healing presence. We need your word of greeting that welcomes us into the community of faith in spite of our doubts and faithlessness. You are the great teacher, and we have come to learn from you. We want to be your disciple. Amen. Join me in our call to confession and our prayer of confession. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn received, that Christ died for our sins. In the mystery of that atoning sacrifice, we come to this time of prayer, bringing our sins to the door of the empty tomb. Let us pray together. We cannot truly worship you, loving God, until we recognize how unloving we have been. We cannot truly live until we admit the many ways we have been dwelling in death. We cannot know forgiveness until we honestly face the wrong we have done and the good we have neglected. We admit before you now the anger and the spite we have carried in our hearts, the doubts and fears we have allowed to paralyze us, the misplaced priorities that have led us away from your will and way. Help us break down the barriers we have erected so we can experience new life today. God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right finds forgiveness and acceptance. 
the one who came to embody love is ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. In Jesus' name, our sins are forgiven and we have been saved. The grace of God is extended to each of us on this day of resurrection. Praise God. I am going to be reading the resurrection story from the Gospel of Mark in the 16th chapter. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 8, and as we'll talk about in the sermon, there is a second ending, um, but uh, most biblical scholars agree that verse, verses 1 through 8 is where Mark finished the story. The 9 through 20 um, was added at a later time. So listen for the word of God from Mark. When the Sabbath, Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, this is the place where they laid him. But go, tell the disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And so they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, Lord, this Easter, this Resurrection Day, open us to what you would have us know about this amazing thing of resurrection, what it does for us, what it means for us, what it means for all people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did any of you watch the HBO series, The Sopranos, when it was on some 14 or 15 years ago. I never did watch it. I heard about it. I know it was a very popular show. It just never grabbed my interest. I was reading one of my commentaries, and they thought that the final scene fit very well into our Mark Easter passage for today. So let me try to paint the scene for you. New Jersey mafioso and family man Tony Soprano arrives early at a diner for a family dinner. Journey's Don't Stop Believing is playing on a jukebox in the background. Tony takes a seat and waits for the family to gather. From years of experience, Tony restlessly watches as customers enter and move about the restaurant, always looking for someone who's out of place, someone who might be looking to kill him. Eventually, the family starts to arrive, first his wife, Carmela, and then son, AJ. Their daughter, Meadow, is out parking the car as a plate of onion rings is placed on the table as an appetizer. Now the drama begins to increase as the camera follows a stranger on his way to the bathroom. Viewers are on edge, waiting for Meadow, wondering if the mysterious bathroom visitor is there to shoot Tony. And then as Meadow reaches the door, 
the diner's kitchen bell rings. Tony looks up. Anyone remember what happened? The camera cuts to black. It was a moment television critic James Hurt said that frustrated millions of fans, many of whom were convinced that their, table, their cable had gone out. The audience was left in blackness for 10 seconds of confusion, surprise, and even anger. And then the credits started to roll, and just like that, the Sopranos was over. Not with a bang or a whimper, but simply vast nothingness. Now that's pretty much the ending of Mark's gospel. Not only does it end abruptly, but Jesus never shows up in the resurrection story here. It really is a strange way to end such a profound story. Mary Magdalene, the Mary, the mother of James and Salome, dutifully make their way to Jesus' grave at first light on Sunday morning. They are bringing spices to carry out the anointing ritual. We even he hear them wonder if there will be anyone there to help roll the stone away that's covering the tomb's opening, and they discovered that the stone has already been rolled away. When they looked inside, they encountered a young man dressed in a white robe, and he tells them to not be alarmed. Please note, that is always the first thing angels say when they encounter human beings. Do not be afraid. The angel tells the women that Jesus has been raised from the dead, and they are to tell the disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of them to Galilee. They will see him there. And so the women went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Cut to black, roll the credits. Mark's ending is the most unsatisfying ending I could think of. It is so unsatisfying that the early church started adding better or more convincing endings to Mark's gospel. Now, no one really knows where those concluding verses came from or when they were added to the Bible. But many of the early church father in the second and third centuries were debating the true ending of Mark's gospel. As scholars point out, scribes obviously thought that Mark's story needed a more appropriate conclusion. So someone came up with a nice, tidy ending. And if that really weren't enough, it's anyone's guess as to why Mark chose to end the gospel this way. Maybe his pencil broke. Maybe the original ending was lost somehow. He didn't hit the save button on his computer. Maybe the author was arrested and never had a chance to finish his work. Or maybe, just maybe, this was the ending that the author intended. Think about it. The women knew that when Jesus was alive, it had been possible for them to imagine a different world where poor people were blessed, sick people were healed, common everyday folk had power. With Jesus, it was possible to imagine a world in which children would lead the way. Lepers could stop begging and become good, responsible members of society. And people with nothing to eat found themselves at a picnic with over 5,000 other people. And there was food left over. When Jesus spoke, 
He spoke with an authority the people had never heard before, and the powers that be quaked. Demons fled. Faint hearts were revived, and those living in despair hoped again. But Friday afternoon, it was all gone. End of the story. So, Sunday morning, when the women came, they came not only to mourn the death of their friend and teacher and to fulfill the proper burial rituals, they also came to say a final goodbye to all the hope that Jesus had inspired over the past three years. And then the young man in a white robe told him, told them that Jesus wasn't there. Could he be telling the truth that Rome really hadn't been able to silence Jesus? That their crucified one had been raised? According to this young man, Jesus had gone ahead of them to Galilee. And the woman could not take it all in. So they fled in terror and amazement. And that may be exactly the way Mark wanted to end his gospel. If the women were filled with terror and amazement, Mark knew that fellow believers down through the years would be as well. He may not have known what we would be afraid of today, only that we would be afraid. So instead of looking back at an empty grave, Mark points us, Mark points the church forward. The disciples are to leave Jerusalem and, de and continue declaring the reign of God, starting in Galilee where it all began. Mark may be trying to say, you want to find Jesus? Don't look here. He's going ahead of you. In other words, God is on the move. And maybe silence is the only appropriate response after all. In the women's silence, space is created for the voice and the presence of God to resound throughout creation. And what could the women have said as they fled from the tomb that wouldn't have trivialized such a moment? You know that anything they would have said about an empty tomb would have somehow been turned around into what they saw or didn't see instead of being focused on what God had accomplished. As the women heard, Jesus is alive. God's hope is still alive. The story of Jesus isn't over yet. The ending is still being written. My friends, hear the good news. Though wounded, peace lives. Though killed, justice rises. Though buried, love goes on ahead of us to Galilee or Delta or Cardiff or Lancaster. There we will see him, just as he told us. Praise be to God. Amen.
We are going to partake of communion. Um, again, for those of you who are at home watching this, you will need to supply your own elements. Um, so if you haven't gotten them yet, um, put me on hold. I'll still be here when you get back. Um, go and get your bread and juice um, or whatever it is you will be um, using. If you don't want to take communion, you can fast forward over this part of it. But for those who are taking communion, according to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread, he broke it, blessed it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Let us pray. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O God. In your wisdom, you made all things and sustained all things by your power. You formed us in your image setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with all of creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey, you did not reject us, but claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to you. And then in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your Son to be one of us, to redeem us and heal our brokenness. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with sinners and outcasts like us, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus, we take from your creation this bread and this wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine that the, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and the blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ that we may be one with all who share this feast. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ for the world today. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus was at table with his disciples, and he took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. Those of you that are taking communion at home, I invite you to go ahead now and eat the bread or whatever it is that you are using for communion.
in the same way he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. And I invite you to go ahead and drink the cup or whatever you are using for communion. Let us pray together. Lord, even in these strange times of COVID and doing communion via videos and YouTubes, it is still your communion. You are still present. So we just ask that you take these gifts and use them for your purposes, we pray. Amen. As we gather for a time of prayer, I commend the names and concerns and joys that Kathy and Linda have sent out um, for the two churches. There are, I heard some comment the other day saying that things are getting back to normal because we are now having more shootings. Um, there's another one in California just the other day. It's just, we need a lot of prayer, folks. We need a lot of God's intervention. So what joys and concerns you have, bring them as we pray together. Oh God, on this day we can almost feel the word wanting to erupt in a glad refrain of Alleluia, and we want to join them. For today is a special day. Even though the world is pretty much the same as yesterday, even though there are still people suffering, even though there are still people who hunger and thirst, even though there is much out there that makes us fearful, despite all of that today, for just this day, we want to celebrate the good news. We want to join with those people around the world who raise their voices celebrating the life that you have given us in Jesus. O oh Lord, grant us the freedom this day to be rejoicing people. We are very aware that there are among us many who do not and cannot feel any sense of joy. For them, life is filled with pain. Disease will not let them claim too much hope. We know people who are alone and angry that they are alone. We know many who are worried about their families, and rightfully so. Lord, we lift all of these people to you. We ask that you touch them in their need and show us how to be your hands that are reaching out. But on this day, we also want to be free to be joy-filled to rejoice in the promise of new life. We want to be free to sing and shout our joyful alleluias. For in the resurrection of Jesus, you have done an amazing thing for us, and we need to celebrate it. Lord, we are the first to admit that there is a lot about resurrection that we do not understand. You know our questions and our doubts. We want to believe. We do believe. We wonder at our unbelief. But for this day, O oh God, help us understand just enough about what faith means, that we are willing to let faith be what it should be, 
conviction without proof, trust without guarantees, joy in a promise which does not have to be fulfilled before it can be enjoyed. This day we want to rejoice, to sing glad alleluias. Grant us the freedom to do so. Amen. In Jesus, we witness courage and faithfulness. At the empty tomb, we meet the power of love. The one who was rejected holds the keys to life, and the key of unconditional love is now passed on to us. We have seen the risen Christ, and we are changed. We have been chosen as witness to the resurrection power in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I wish you a happy Easter, and whatever plans you have for this afternoon and this week, enjoy them. Uh, continue to be safe. I hope you guys are getting your vaccine shots and that you continue to stay distant and masked. Um, we're we seem to be coming to an end of this COVID, um, but we're not done yet. We're not done yet. We still have work to do. So be safe and enjoy. God bless. <laughs>